Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Fellowship Church of Tennessee, Illinois, on this October 27th day. Boy, we're running right through this month. We'll be in the November, and we have a busy month of November here at the church, as well as probably at your house and mine. Uh, Announcements for this week. There will be no evening service tonight. Uh, Pastor Kevin's with us today to bring the message, and we appreciate him a lot. And he informed me this morning he's got his crops out, so he's ready to go. And he's going to be preaching this morning on uh, Isaiah chapter 1, 1 through 20. So have your Bibles ready. Um, Friday, just for a heads up, uh, Pastor Dave and Carrie is going to be uh, hosting a crew event. It's, he just helps out a little bit with crew once in a while because they, their leader 
is so busy he can't get over here very often. He spends a lot of his time at Illinois State, and uh, so he's going. They're going to have a weenie roast out to his house if it's nice. If not, they're going to have it in the house and use the fireplace. So, pray for that uh, activity coming up next Sunday. Holiday fellowship dinner here at the church. After the morning service, ham and turkey will be provided. There's a sign-up sheet out there on the table if you'd please sign up. And we really hope everyone comes and uh, sign up the sheet and tell us what you're going to bring. So kind of have an idea. And uh, so I hope to see you all there. Uh, November the 4th, men's Bible study here at 1 o'clock. And last month we had a wonderful study, and we're going to continue in that study. So mark that on your calendars. Um, November the 5th, we're going to have... Uh, they're going to be using our basement for the general election. And please, please, please go out and vote. And we just pray that the right person takes office. And uh, so pray for that situation too. Uh, the 10th, November 10th, uh, there will be five churches get together at uh, Larry Rickards Church there in Colchester. And uh, we'll, we did that one other time about a couple, three months ago or so, and we're all going to sing praises and uh, we'll have a food fellowship afterwards and uh, everybody bring a, a finger food or a snack to pass whatever and uh, it, it was a wonderful time last time we did it so I hope, hope it's the same this time I'm sure it will be so please put that on your calendar um, November the 11th we have a board meeting here at the church uh, at 9 o'clock the 24th, Carrie and Pastor will be in Indiana with family, and so they'll be gone, and Kevin will be back with us, Lord willing, and uh, then to get into December and candlelight carols and things like that. So we got a busy month of November, and he'll be here, like I say, before you know it, the end of the week. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Pastor wanted to just say thank you to all this the uh, pastor says he's got a note to bottom. says this pastor would like to express his appreciation and love for all of you. What a blessing you serve the Lord Jesus with you. May we continue together in faithful service as we wait for our Lord to return. Love, Pastor Dave and Carrie. So thank you for that. Um, praise note, some of the farmers are getting some of the crops out. Most of them are getting the beans are just, I would say, 99.5% out. They're getting their corn out. <clears throat> Continue to pray for safety for them. And uh, I think some of them's got some fall tillage to do, and get some fertilizer and lime spread and things like that. So just continue to pray for them as they're putting in long hours. And we thank you for our farmers. Um, anybody got any other announcements, Rich? Did I miss anything? Nope. Okay. Good. I always ask him. Uh, hey, Randy. Yes, ma'am. The time change. Yeah, when is that? Next Sunday, right, Tim? Saturday night, Sunday. So yes. next Sunday we'll, let's see, fall back. Is that the way we do that? I think so. Yeah, spring forward and fall back. If I think you're that. here early, you'll know you didn't change your time. Yourself. That's right, that's right. Okay. I wish they'd just leave it the same all the time. It'd make it less, less confusing, but I'm nobody, so it don't matter. Um, get into our praise, or get into our prayer request this morning. Uh, my sister Jolene's going to have knee surgery Tuesday up at the Quad Cities. They're going to replace her knee and they're going to use a, I don't know what you call it, robot or whatever they use now. They don't use the, the old scalpel and all that like they did on mine. But she's going to have that done Tuesday and uh, she's a fretting it. But uh, she's in so much pain she's got to have something done. So, Debbie, you got a report on Stephanie. Did she find out anything? She has. So Wonderful. The steroid done a little bit. Um, she's walking much better. Um, right. She did something this weekend that I wouldn't have suggested, but she promised her kids that they would go on this little trip, and she did. Well, that sounds like stepping. Come back to that. Yeah. yeah. and I can't yeah. do that right? yeah. with my back Maybe I just <coughs> yeah she has the pillows right certain parts of her legs and 
Good. Okay. Uh, Thanks for praying for us. Steve, your, your test still going good? Good, good. Anybody got any other requests this morning? Boy, that's great. Uh, okay. Uh, continue, like I say, pray for our election a week from Tuesday. And uh, to continue to pray for our farmers as they're finishing up, getting their grain and stuff out. Safety there. Uh, a friend of mine had a little accident the other night. She ran into the back of an auger wagon, one of those great big ones. They didn't have no lights on it. She plowed it and tore her car up, hurt herself. She's got some bumps and bruises, but she, I think she'll be fine. This is going to take time. Um, what else am I going to say? I guess that's it. Okay, let's go with prayer, please, at this time. And uh, our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for a beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. And we thank you for each and every day. We thank you for your guidance, your love, and your uh, your word. We thank you for Kevin coming today. We thank you so much for him as he brings thy word to us. We thank you for a man that preaches the word. And uh, we continue to pray for his safety and his uh, as he preaches each we can differ churches. We thank you for that. We thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for uh, being able to bring these requests to you this morning. And uh, we, we continue to pray for Steffi. We pray that you will just keep her safe and uh, they can figure out what, how to fix her back. And uh, as she has these young kids and, and she's a good mama and she just prays for her. We pray for uh, other things in our church. We pray for each and every one of our congregation, we thank you for coming today, and the ones that couldn't make it, we just pray that you would uh, uh, just be with them for whatever. We, we think of our elderly as well. We just pray for them each and every day. We thank you for our little church here. We thank you for a wonderful pianist and a wonderful song leader. We thank you for that. And we just uh, pray for our election coming up on Tuesday, or a week from Tuesday. We just we just continue to pray uh, for that. We thank you for all you do for us, for your love, your guidance. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, uh, we have two songs this morning. <clears throat> We're going to sing the first song and sit for the second song. Then we have one song at the end of the service. So let's please stand and sing, Holy God, we praise thy name. Number two. Please be seated. 
One second. <clears throat> okay, we'll sing holy, holy, holy. After verse 3, we do the key change and do verse 4. We will not do the ending.
Good Good morning. Isaiah chapter number one in your Bible this morning. Isaiah chapter number one. I appreciate you showing up this morning. If nobody had showed up, I would have taken the hint, but uh, I'm glad you showed up and I'm thankful to your pastor for allowing me the opportunity to preach here this morning. Isaiah chapter one, you got it? Look with me in verse number one of Isaiah chapter number one. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. O sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Will ye, ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate, is overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, and as a, as a lodge and a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. To judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Before we go further this morning, let's ask God's blessing on our time. Father, I acknowledge before you this morning that in here we are incapable of accomplishing spiritual good if you don't help us we are incapable of worshiping you this morning if you don't help us and there's things fighting for our attention this morning things of this past week things of this coming week that are vying for our thought thoughts this morning and so we ask that you would help us to focus on you and on your word may you be magnified this morning we acknowledge we are in desperate need of your help And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of Isaiah was penned by, obviously, Isaiah, and it was written to the southern kingdom of the divided kingdom of Israel. The kings of the 
nation of Judah, as the southern kingdom was referred to during the ministry of Isaiah, are mentioned there in verse 1 of chapter 1. And the nation was in corruption. And while the southern kingdom would occasionally have times of good kings and uh, being closer to God, yet the downward trend becomes apparent as you begin to read through the divided kingdom and all that goes on. And as these people to which Isaiah begins this message that he is inspired to give to the southern nation of Israel, the nation known as Judah. You know, most of us, I would say, are repulsed by hypocrisy as long as we're not talking about our own hypocrisy, right? Uh, this, I'm sure this is everybody's favorite time every four years, right? We love political ads, don't we? I mean, you love watching them on TV or hearing them on the radio. It's just fake, right? Everybody loves that? No, pro probably not. In fact, most of us, if we were to uh, say one of the great complaints we have about political leaders is hypocrisy. Uh, we know that there are some good ones. We know, in fact, that, that, that hopefully there are those that maybe we would say aren't that way, but there's plenty over the course of your life that you have seen that have made great promises on the campaign trail. And then they get to Washington, D.C. or Springfield and, well, maybe not keep exactly those promises because that doesn't advance my personal agenda and we don't like hypocrisy. But if you were to ask the common person on the street, the average human walking down the square in Macomb or whatever, of their list of the greatest hypocrites, perhaps politicians would be on that list, but unfortunately, for in the eyes of many, especially the lost world, <coughs> churchgoers would be on that list. And it's on that list mainly because humans come to church and humans are hypocrites. We have hypocritic tendencies. Uh, we have tendencies to not be the most genuine all the time. And the only wrong there is a time to put your best foot forward, right? You remember when you were a kid and there was company coming over to the house and your mom made you clean your room. And you said, Mom, the company's not coming in my room. And she said, I don't care, clean your room. And then as you got to be an adult, you realize when somebody's coming over to the house, you try to make it look like you live in that clean of an environment all the time. But when there's four kids running around the house, it is there is no chance that the house stays that clean all the time. But there's a time to put your best foot forward. There is a time to, as the saying goes, fake it till you make it, right? When you Maybe you remember back to when you were young and you got one of your first jobs and you felt like you had no idea what you were doing, but you had to put on the front like... I've got this figured out. You had to at least give some semblance of confidence that you actually knew what you were doing. And so there was a time and a place for that. But oftentimes, we tend to uh, have an inclination to be a little less than genuine. I remember when I was in college, we had a uh, minister that was teaching us and or I don't maybe it's a sermon I don't know at some point one of them said that he would rather do a funeral than a wedding and you think funerals the funerals don't really seem like the the happiest time and yet weddings seem like this happy time but the reality is is when you have a wedding everything is not everything but a lot of stuff is a little bit fake right I mean everybody's on their best behavior all everybody I mean the bride is probably dressed nicer than she will be for most every other day of their married life, right? She's All the, the makeup's been done by some, the hair's been done by a professional. You know, the groom is actually smells decent for a change and you know, the chances of that lasting very long are very short and everybody's on their best behavior, but it's not the most real, right? Eventually you get into married life and you know, stuff, you, you wake up next to that same person that you just and their hair's all messed up and you know, they have dragon breath in the morning. But when you get to a funeral, everybody's more genuine because the grief is real and the things and all the, there's, there's no point in being fake as much because 
the reality of the situation is, is grief and it t tends to bring out a more genuine behavior. And in our text this morning, we see the southern kingdom of Israel, known as Judah, doing what we often are prone to do. To live one way and yet pre pretend, and when it comes time to put on the spiritual show, to put on the spiritual show. The first thing I see this morning in our text is the true situation of the people. God begins to bring this accusation through the prophet Isaiah to the people. Beginning in verse number 2, we begin to see how he, they have forgotten the goodness of God to them. In verse 2, God calls the heavens and the earth as a witness. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. The Lord hath spoken, I have nourished, and brought up children. And they have rebelled against me. God had been so gracious to them. He had brought them out of the bondage of Egypt and sustained them in the wilderness. He had brought them victoriously into the promised land and set them up for success and did miraculously to their benefit. And yet they had rebelled against Him. They had oftentimes, especially if you go to look at the northern kingdom, which was much uh, more prone to evil than the southern kingdom was, but the northern kingdom, we, we think of the uh, running after the gods of Baal, but even in the southern kingdom, you'll find that in our text this morning, he mentions some things about that's how they take advantage of the less fortunate, how they would live in selfish and selfishness and greed. And the people had turned from the law that their ancestors had committed to obey at Mount Sinai. And they were living for themselves. In fact, God begins to make the accusation that the animals know better than the children of Judah do. He says in verse number 3, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel, does, Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. He says the ox knows who the owner is and submits to the owner. The, the, the donkey knows uh, the master's soul and he knows where his provisions come from. And yet Israel does not. And yet these people of the nation of Judah during this case that Isaiah makes against them through inspiration continues to headlong into sin. Verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They were laden with iniquity. They were heavy with perversity. Not an indication that they had made one poor choice or that they had uh, begun to think about doing that which was wrong, but they had gone wholeheartedly after sin. They had gone wholeheartedly in the opposite direction that God had told them to go. They were a seed of evildoers. A generational condition. That was progressing more and more. They were continuing the footsteps of the previous generation and they were children that destroyed and decayed. Not a great description. They were forsaking their God. Verse number 4 of Isaiah 1, the second part says, They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backward. They were loosing themselves from the Lord. They were provoking, causing to bloom the anger of the Lord, which never seems in Scripture to be a good place to be at. And they were headed in the wrong direction. They were going away backward. Perhaps they would have called themselves progressive. Maybe they would have called themselves woke in our society as we call it today. But yet in the eyes of God, they were heading backward. And as such, they were facing judgment. In verse 5, Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. They were stubborn and stiff-necked people. They had been struck for their sin. They had begun to reap the consequences of their turning from God. God had made it very clear when the law had been given that you follow what I have said and there is blessings and you turn from it and there is cursings and they are beginning to face the consequences of the choices that they had made. And God says, why should you be stricken anymore? Literally means upon what? He says, basically, I have smitten you here and there and everywhere and you are not turning back to me. 
And they carry on in their sin despite its more and more judgment. The Bible says the head is sick. The heart is faint. In verse 6, from the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed. Neither bound up. Neither mollified with ointment. From the sole of the foot to the top of the head, there is no wholesomeness in them. They are being they have been smitten by God, and yet they are continuing on in their sin. In fact, they are continuing in being conquered. Verse 7: Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. God had allowed them to uh, the the enemies to begin to conquer this land and they were being conquered under the reign of Joash. The Syrians would come in during the reign of Amaziah. Israel, the northern kingdom, would, would fight against them. Strangers were now in the land and Jerusalem is left as a remnant, God says in verse 8, and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage, a, a temporary shelter for the grape gatherers, a cottage in a vineyard, and as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. Jerusalem is a remnant not for long. The city which the nation was once ruled from and which the presence of God once dwelt is now described as a last holdout that would soon fall. And he makes God makes this accusation, this comparison to them. He says in verse 9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like to Gomorrah. He says, O oh Israel, O oh, oh, oh Judah, you are uh, left a small remnant, but if I hadn't done that, you would have been wiped out just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you know your Old Testament history, if there's a couple cities you don't want to be compared to, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. Not a good situation. There is nothing about God's description of the nation of Judah that Isaiah starts his message off with that you look at and say, okay, we've got things going well there. There is nothing. Maybe the only thing you can look at and say is the fact that he has been gracious and left a small remnant. But everything else is rebellion and sin and destruction that comes with it. The situation of the people wasn't good, but the second thing I see this morning is the show of the people. You say, wow, they must have really just completely turned away from, from everything that involved the, the, the temple and all the, the worship that was involved and all the, the ceremony and, and all the feasts and all that, but we see here that that was not the case. They were still putting on the outward show of religion. In verse number 10, God gives them a shocking reality when He says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. He literally calls the rulers of the land, Sodom, the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah, pointing out once again of how in His nostrils their, their incense has become so vile. He says in verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. They offered a multitude of sacrifices. They were going after, they would turn from the, the law of their God and they were taking advantage of people and they were living in their day-to-day -day lives as though they didn't stand before the holy God of the universe. Yet when it came time as a nation to put on the spiritual show of the, the burnt offerings and the, 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 the offering of the animals and the blood and all of that, yet they kept all of these things of the outward nature. They would slaughter the animals and offer the offerings and give the morning and evening burnt offering. And at the Sabbaths, they would offer the burnt offerings in the beginning of the months and the Passovers and the feasts and the new moons and all of those things. If you don't know about them, look back in the Old Testament law and there's a lot of them. And they were keeping the outward form of religion. Religion. 
Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations or offerings, whatever your text might say. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands to pray, your hands I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. They would continue to offer prayers. They would continue to celebrate their, the feast that they're supposed to celebrate. They continue to bring the offerings. And yet, what is God's view of all of this? Did God say, oh, Judah, you're doing wrong here. I've got this long list of how you've rebelled against me, but I sure am glad you're still bringing the sacrifices. I sure am glad you're still offering in the... The, the priests are still offering and the offerings are still being brought and you're still keeping the feasts and you're still celebrating the, all of the things that I told you. I'm so glad you're doing that. that I just, I'm thrilled with that. Is that what he says here? Answer me this. Did God institute all of these things that they're doing? Yes, He did. He instituted the sacrifices. He instituted the burnt offerings. He's instituted the sin offerings and the trespass offerings and the thank offerings and the drink offerings and the all the festivals and the feasts of tabernacle, all of those things. He instituted all of those things. So did He desire those things? Yes, He did desire those things. But what was the point of all of those things? Was it so that we could have a form? Is it so that we could have a, uh, that they could have a, a ritual to go through? Is it so that God could get some thrill out of how they would show up at this place at this time and do this thing and that was it? God's intent was never that it be a hollow show of, of, of people that had run away from Him just to put on a, a spiritual front. He wanted all of these things to come first and foremost from the heart of the people and yet the far heart of the people were far from Him. If you look over into Isaiah chapter number 29, Isaiah makes the statement, or God makes the statement that these people draw near me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And Jesus would again make that reference, I believe, is in Matthew chapter 15. And God's view of their actions was not of, oh, I'm glad they're still keeping it, but he loathed it. In fact, to the point he says, stop bringing your empty offerings. Your incense disgusts me. Your religious holidays, I, I cannot bear them. I cannot tolerate them anymore. That which you think is religious is actually iniquity. I hate your celebrations and they are a burden to me that I am tired of carrying. And when you make prayers to me, I will not hear. Their show was really a waste of everyone's time. Have you ever come to the point that you thought you were pulling the wool over somebody's eyes? Or have you ever been the one that somebody pulled the wool over your eyes? They made a great show. They made a great statement. They made a great promise, whatever it was, and then you realized that there's nothing about them that's genuine. They did not intend to fulfill the promise they made. They are not capable of fulfilling the promise they made. And they pulled the wool over my eyes. I know how easy it... Well, e 
maybe easy it is in our society to pull the wool over some other human's eyes. It's easy to walk in here on a Sunday morning and everything looks great, right? We've all bathed at least once in the last week, hopefully. You know, we've all got our uh, spiritual look about us. We know when to come in and say, Amen, brother. God bless you. Good to see you. And we know the spiritual talk to talk. But I would submit to you, there's one whose eyes you'll never pull the wool over. Have you ever thought about the, excuse me, the futility of lying to God? Have you ever, you ever caught yourself lying to God? Probably have. Have you ever, think, have you ever stopped to think about how futile that is? How futile it is to think that God doesn't, hasn't seen everything that went on in my life for the past six days, but as long as I'm here on Sunday morning, He is just fine with it. Oh, how prone we are because we can do that with humans to think that somehow we can do it with God. And so if our text ended there this morning, it would be a very discouraging message, would it not? You'd all walk out of here and say, I hope he doesn't come back in a month when Pastor has him scheduled again because he's pretty discouraging. But I'm thankful there's a God who gives a recipe to these people. Yes. He doesn't say, you've messed up, so stinks to be you. <laughs> yeah. What does he say? He makes the very simple claim. He says, repent, in other words. Verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then this great verse, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God calls the people of Judah to repent, to cease from doing evil and learning to do well. Their fellowship with their God hinges on their choice. They do not have to continue going in the same direction. But if they want a different result, it's going to require them changing. In Psalm 24, the psalmist David reminds us, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. God says to the nation, if you want, I'll forgive, but it hinges on your choice. If you want to keep going down the same path you're on, you'll keep reaping the same results you're reaping. But if you'll come to me and do this thing called repenting, you'll find forgiveness. Their sin was great, though your sins be as scarlet. Though they're stained beyond what you think you can ever get out. You remember as a child when you stained your clothes and mama might have had the secret detergent or whatever her go-to was to get it out, but if it was bad enough, it wasn't going, anybody like me, you leave a Sharpie marker in your pocket and it goes through the washing machine. Thankfully, I've not had any huge disasters, but occasionally there'll be a shirt, a, a blotch on something. It doesn't matter what my wife concoction chemistry she comes up with, you're not getting a Sharpie, a, a permanent marker, out of that shirt. But God says, though your sins are like scarlet, hey, when I get a hold of them, when I do what I do with them, they shall be white as snow. Ultimately, because of, a th of thousands of years later, or however many years later it was, when the precious Son of God came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and went to a cross to pay for the sins of all mankind, and His blood can take the darkest sinner and wash them and make them clean. 
And he says, though your sins are seen beyond too great, yet when you come to me, there is forgiveness when you'll turn and repent. And though they are scar scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And he says, if you be willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. Just like he had promised years ago when the law was given, there, there's the, the blessing of obedience. But he says in verse 20, But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The blessing of obedience or the curse of disobedience. We live in a time, just like most all time, where man has come up with all kinds of religion, how to get made right with God. And if you ask the average Joe on the street today, you probably would get an answer at some point that the way you get right with God is some list of things. How can you go to heaven when you die? Do this, do this, be baptized, be catechized, be pasteurized, be whatever, homogenized. No. Go, uh, if you give enough, do this and this and this and check this off your list and you'll be fine. And I'm going to assume in here that most of us in here would understand that there is no salvation by any means other than the name of Jesus Christ and that no amount of good works, no amount of church deeds, no amount of showing up anywhere on a Sunday morning, no amount of money in an offering plate, no amount of times you're taking communion, no matter, no matter whatever baptismal tank it was, sprinkled, dunked, whatever it was, none of that takes a sinful heart and makes it right before a holy God. And I would assume most all of us in here would testify to that truth. And if you haven't this morning, you ought to. And you ought to come find forgiveness and the only source of forgiveness, not in the stuff and the things that every man-made religion has come up with. But most of us in here, I'm going to assume, have come to faith in Christ. We sometimes get a little, I'll say confused, more like we lie to ourselves and think, that no, I don't need, I don't have to go through this list for salvation. But if I go through that list, whatever your list is, God will just overlook the stuff of the past week. If I show up in church on Sunday morning, you know, a pastor really ought to send me a thank you letter because I showed up. And God probably is pretty grateful that I showed up on Sunday morning. I even showed up on Sunday night. And we tend to think that if as long as the outward is okay, when the right people are watching, that God's okay. And we're no different than the children of Judah were however many thousands of years ago this was. Because mankind hasn't changed after all of these years. I can spend my week bitter against this person that wronged me, not willing to forgive them, holding it over their heads if nothing else in my heart. And bitterness can eat me up all week, but as long as I show up on Sunday morning and I sing the hymns, and I'm supposed to sing the hymns, and I say the right words, I think God will be okay with it. In fact, he'll, he'll accept my worship. Hey, in, all, in my business dealings this week, I, I might not have acted in the most Christ-like manner. Uh, I, I might have cheated a little bit on this, or I, I might have come across as an absolute uh, jerk to this person and not shown the love of Christ. But as long as I show up on Sunday morning, or well, as long as I'm spiritual when the preacher's around, God will be okay with it, I think. I think He'll accept my worship. 
Hey, there were some things that came across a screen in my house this week. Television, computer, phone. Their screens are everywhere, so you choose what screen you want to talk about. There's some things that came up across it, and I didn't turn away from it. I just kind of indulged in it. But I'm here on Sunday morning, so I think God's okay with it. He'll overlook that, cause, and he'll accept my worship here on Sunday morning. Whatever it is in your life, whatever the Holy Spirit of God reaches down and touches, and, and I hope it's nothing this morning. I hope it's just. I hope this morning we're just warning about the dangers of what could happen. But maybe there's something in your heart. Maybe you're like me, and it's easy to spend the week and you know blow up at my wife or or not do right by my kids or whatever it is and then think that I can come in here on Sunday morning and lift up hands in worship and that God's just going to accept it and yet I would submit that the same thing that held true to the children of Judah is true that God doesn't want your outward show of religion he wants your heart he wants your walk does God want me and does he want you here on Sunday morning worshiping I think he desires it. He wouldn't have told us to not forsake assembling together. He wouldn't have instituted the local church if he didn't have some in part of that. Does he want us to pray? Obviously. Does he want us to spend time in his word? Obviously. But does he want us to do it so we can check it off our list and somehow that makes us spiritual because we went through the checklist? No, he says, I want you to walk with me. In the Sunday school class I teach at my church, I've been going through this lesson series on this thing called the will of God and how we sometimes overcomplicate it. We turn it into this thing or that thing and a, a location or a vocation and all of that. When you, but when you begin to look at the scriptures and what God says the will of God is, he says things like in Micah 6, 8, he says, Hear, O man, what did the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. He says things in the New Testament, the will of God is your sanctification, that you be set apart for the service of Almighty God. Though the will of God is that you rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks. He says things that have to do with your character. God wants your walk. God wants your heart. God wants you on Monday morning. God wants you on Tuesday afternoon. God wants you on Wednesday night just when you come in for Bible study or whenever it is. God wants you. And then when He has you, then you can offer up worship that is acceptable. So you say then, so Kevin, you're saying only perfect people can come to church. No, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, Isaiah will get to chapter 6. And you have this great vision how Isaiah sees into the, the throne room of heaven, basically. In fact, it's the, kind of the scriptural basis behind the song we sung this morning of holy, holy, holy. Isaiah gets this glimpse of the throne room of heaven in the year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And he sees these seraphims, these angels surrounding the throne. And they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah gets a glimpse of the throne room of heaven, what does he say? He says, woe is me. I am unclean. And in fact, oftentimes in the midst of, as we gather for worship, we actually, as we look closer at a holy God, we begin to see new things in our life that are less holy about ourselves. I'm not teaching this morning that you've got to be perfect before you show up here. But you also can't be holding on to sin and thinking God will be okay with it as long as I put on the outward show. But instead, as I begin to draw closer to Him, as He begins to reveal things to me, then I come to that place of saying, you're right, I'm wrong. And that precious blood that was shed on the cross still cleanses from all iniquity. And you might be as saved as the Apostle Paul in here this morning, but on your daily walk, you're going to find yourself doing things, saying things that need God to, you need to go to God with some confession and say, I'm confessing. I've fallen far short yet once again, God, and I'm not going to act like it's no big deal because it was a big deal. It was so big that it cost the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll confess it, and I'll forsake it, 
And that scripture says, you'll have mercy. Because really the choice is yours. You were not under the covenant that Israel was under. We're not promised the promised land or, or anything like that. But you know why God tells us how to live and how not to live? Because he knows what's best for us. My children, just like I did as a child, thought that mom and dad's goal was to make my life miserable. But as you get to be an adult, you realize my goal is not to make their lives miserable. My goal is to protect them. My goal is to make them into profitable, productive humans in society. My goal is to make them into people that love their God. And so it is with our Father in heaven. He doesn't give us a list of rules and say, keep them because I want you to have rules. He says, this is what's best for you. We're living in a time in a society where the further we get away from God, the further we begin to reap the consequences of wandering from Him. And we're trying to figure out everything we can to salve the problems that we're creating for ourselves only to see the only way is to turn back to Christ. And if you want God's best, if you want the peace and the joy that He offers, just like He says to Judah, I'm offering it to you if you'll turn to Me. But if you won't, You'll keep reaping the same consequences you're reaping. God made us to worship. God desires us to worship. But when we come to Him with filthy hands and impure hearts, our worship is no longer a sweet incense, but rather, rather a loathsome smell in His nostrils. The good news is the blood covers all sins. If you'll humble yourself, and return to Him. The blood still cleanses. And you can present a sweet-smelling incense of worship. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank You now for this, Your Word. Oh, help us not to be caught up in a show. We acknowledge we can't fool You, God. So we ask that You would help us to be genuine help me to be genuine. I pray everyone in here this morning would do the same. Help us to be honest with you. When you begin to show things, may we not just think we can cover it up with more religious show, but may we want run to you in humility and find the restoration of fellowship that you desire us to have. Thank you for this word from uh, Isaiah that you gave him, and I pray that here thousands of years later we'll apply it in our lives this week. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We shall sing the four, the five verses of O Worship the King. We will not sing the optional ending, and we will stand and sing that, and then we will have our final prayer by Randy Copeland. Please stand. One oh four, verse three. Sorry. Why bountiful care? What tongue can recite? 
sin out there, Lord. We just pray that we can get spread the word. You are the king. You are a master. We thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for uh, the guidance. And uh, we thank you for this great earth that we live on. Now, God, direct us now as we leave this building today. Give us a day of peace, a day of rest, a day of family. We thank you for all you do. And uh, dismiss us now in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.